All right. Um, well, thanks everyone for coming today. Uh, my name is Samit Federa, and I'm going to be talking about some of our minimally invasive techniques in epilepsy surgery. Um, <clears throat> epilepsy surgery is kind of different than most other neurosurgeries in that we use a lot of technology and techniques that I think really make it um, very, very, you know, kind of at the cutting edge in terms of a lot of the things we do. Uh, just to give you some background, um, my, uh, I work at UC Irvine. I'm the director of epilepsy surgery at UC Irvine. I've been here for about seven years and uh, I'm very excited to tell you a little bit about our program as well as some of the really exciting technological things that we do here. So just to start, uh, this is kind of just a very broad outline. I'm going to start by talking about the evolution of technology in epilepsy surgery. And then I'm going to talk about some of our surgical implantation techniques. Um, then we're going to go into some of the neuromodulation that we do. Uh, that's uh, especially the neuropace, DBS, vagus nerve stimulation. I'm going to talk about focused ultrasound as well as laser ablation. And then I'm going to talk at the end about MRI negative epilepsy. And throughout the uh, talk, if anyone has questions, please feel free to, to put them on the uh, chat. I may not see them, but uh, if, if someone can stop me and let me know, I'm happy to stop. Otherwise, we can do all our questions at the end. So to begin with, let's talk about the evolution of technology. Um, this is a picture that I always show. Those of you who've seen my talks in the past, I, I love this picture. It's a picture that was taken about 80 years ago. And um, really, the, the important part of this is that it, it shows kind of the um, uh, team approach that we have in epilepsy surgery. And so what you're looking at here is there's a patient down at the bottom. He's uh, actually awake. The surgeons, there's two surgeons. They're standing at the head just above him. Uh, Dr. Wilder Penfield uh, is one of those surgeons. You can see there's a neuropsych uh, doctor who's actually talking to the patient while he's awake. And then in the background, you see Dr. Jasper, who's a uh, epileptologist. And Really, I like this photograph for many reasons, but one of the reasons here is that it, it just shows you what a team approach it is in epilepsy surgery. Unlike some of the other things we do, really, I think that you really need a very good team to um, really give the patients the best likelihood of becoming seizure free. The other reason I like this picture is because despite this being 80 years old, uh, we use a lot of the same techniques and technology uh, that we did even back then during Dr. Penfield's time. So what I'm going to start with is talking about what the uh, one of the big questions was in epilepsy surgery about 80 years ago. Um, when patients had tumors or strokes or brain injuries, there was a thought that uh, that tumor or that, that injury was the cause of the seizures. And so when people remove those areas, if you say, let's say you had a tumor and you took out that tumor, the thought was you should have become seizure free. Unfortunately, that was really never the case. When we were doing these tumor resections, the patients continued to have seizures, even if the tumor was completely removed. And it wasn't really until Penfield and Jasper around the time of that photograph that they did some really interesting experiments where they had patients who were awake, who had seizures, and they would stimulate the brain in various areas. What they found was that if you stimulated the tumor, for instance, you would not see any seizures, you know, you couldn't create seizures. Whereas if you stimulate it around that area, oftentimes you could find some area of irritated brain that when you stimulated it, you actually could create the patient's same type of seizures. And really, it wasn't until you removed both the, the lesion as well as that area that you could actually make someone seizure free. Now, this was a major thing back 80 years ago. Thankfully, now we don't do we don't need to do awake surgery to get that kind of information. We have lots of non diagnostic non invasive diagnostic testing that we use. These are just some of the studies you may have heard about, like PET scans, SPECT studies, MEG. Uh, we have a very high resolution MRI that allows us to see some of those very difficult lesions that are very small potentially that can localize where the seizures come from. Now. As of today, we understand epilepsy is very different than what they understood that 80 years ago. We understand that not only is there this um, lesional zone, which is potentially if there's a lesion in the brain, we also understand, as I mentioned before, that ictal onset zone is where the actual seizures come from. And again, that's generally associated with irritated brain in the surrounding vicinity of that lesion. 
Then we have what's called the uh, irritative zone. And generally that's a part of the brain that's much larger and is irritated by the seizure onset. Then what you see is the symptomatogenic zone. And what that really means is that oftentimes we see people who have seizures starting in one location, but because of the rapid spread of that seizure, you can see symptoms that go to different areas within the brain. And all these things help us understand better where those seizures come from. Now, the, one of the really important things to understand is what is the epileptogenic zone? And really, this is a theoretical part of the brain that is causing the seizures. The only way for us to know where the epileptogenic zone is, is for us to do some sort of a surgery. And we're going to talk more about those surgeries. And if the person is seizure-free afterwards, then we know that within that area, we were able to remove that epileptogenic zone. Unfortunately, there's no non-invasive test that can really tell us where exactly that area is. Although, um, as we're going to talk about, we're, we use all these non-invasive tests to try and localize where that comes from. So this is how we, this is our treatment algorithm for patients who have epilepsy when they come to see us. Generally, that patient will start by seeing our epileptologist. They get a history and examination. Oftentimes, neuropsych will see them. They get a high-resolution MRI, as well as a inpatient video EEG monitoring. Then based upon what we find there, we may want to do additional testing, such as those tests I showed you earlier, PET study, fMRI, WADA, MEG. And then based on the outcome from that, really that's when epilepsy surgery starts to, to be a potential discussion point. And I'm going to talk a little bit about this uh, in a couple of slides, but there's two broad categories of epilepsy surgery. Um, we'll go to that right now. So actually, I'm sorry, we're, we're going to, uh, the two broad categories of epilepsy surgery. The first is diagnostic procedures, and you'll see some of those uh, uh, in a few slides. Basically, what those do is we implant electrodes into the brain and on the surface of the brain with the idea of trying to better localize exactly where the seizures come from. The other type are therapeutic surgeries, and that's going to be the end part of our talk, talking about some of the minimally invasive surgeries we have, as well as some of the other types of surgeries. So now I want to talk about the surgical implantation process. And really, this is where the uh, te newest technology and very exciting work is, is being done in epilepsy surgery. Um, so to give you some history, back at the time of Penfield, who I showed you earlier, 80 years ago, these were the devices that we used back then. <clears throat> these were actually all devices invented by Dr. Penfield, and we still use them almost every single day. Um, they're, the benefits to all these devices you see here are that they're effective, they're very easy to use, they're safe, they're durable, and really they're time-saving. So what I would tell you is that any new technology, new devices that come into neurosurgery really have to meet those same types of criteria. And really there's three broad categories that we're gonna talk about. The top right, we, we're gonna talk about some of the newest robots that we use in neurosurgery. Uh, in the middle, we're gonna talk about some of the neurostimulators that we use. And these are some of the most, um, uh, the, the, the kind of the cutting edge of what we have available. And then at the bottom right, which we're going to talk about some of our minimally invasive laser surgeries and some of the other types of surgeries we have available. So I just wanted to e explain the robots. When people hear about robots, they get very excited. Um, <clears throat> and this is kind of what the future of neurosurgery looks like. There are several types of robots that we have. There's a telesurgical robot, and the most, the, uh, the, the one that's farthest along is called the neuroarm. And basically what that is, is that a surgeon can sit outside of the, the OR or at the, away from the patient and use a robot, you know, um, kind of like you may have seen the da Vinci robot. The, the next one is a supervisor surgeon controlled robot. And this is what you see here in the middle, the ROSA. This is the robot that we have at UCI, and this is the most common current robot available. Um, and then finally, we have handheld or shared controlled ones. There's two that are currently uh, being working on being FDA approved. One's called the Steady Hand, and one's called the Neuro Robot. Um, only a few of these have been FDA approved. So the bulk of my talk is going to be on this supervisory surgeon controlled robot, the middle one, also called the ROSA. Um, so at UCI, we've had the robot for almost seven years now, 
Uh, we've written several papers on it. We've had really, really excellent um, uh, usage of, of it. And now I'm actually going to show you how that workflow looks like. Um, some, if there are any pay people in the audience who may have a little bit of uh, uneasiness with looking at uh, surgery or pictures of the brain, just be careful for the next few slides. After that, we're going to go away from that. So um, the, the idea, as I mentioned before, is that when we do these invasive studies, the goal of that is to better localize exactly where the seizures are coming from. Sometimes we can, if we do all the non-invasive tests and that points to a certain area of the brain, we don't have to go through these invasive monitoring studies. Oftentimes, though, especially patients who have had very complex types of epilepsy or epilepsy, which we can't very easily localize, those patients often do need this invasive monitoring. And here you can see, again, these two broad categories of surgeries that we have. So let's start by talking about the diagnostic procedures. These are the two main ones that we do. The one on the left is called a subdural grid. As I mentioned, that's a grid that we implant along the surface of the brain. The one on the right is SEEG. And this is, we do this very, very commonly at UCI. And essentially it is a minimally invasive method to sample the superficial and deep parts of the brain. Um, I'm gonna show you this first. So this is the what an SEEG looks like. Uh, after it's complete. And what you see here is that we have these pinhole openings in the skin, and these, these depth electrodes go down into the deep structures within the brain. So the process through which we do this, at, we talk about our patients in our epilepsy conference, and as a group, we decide where we think the seizures are most likely coming from. You can see a, a sample map that I've shown you here, essentially looking at uh, the areas of the brain that we believe could be potentially where the seizures come from. This is a map that the, the epileptologist and myself, we work together on to create. And once that's done, then that is essentially our plan for the surgery. Now what we do is we obtain a very high resolution MRI. And within that MRI, we are able to see the, uh, all the blood vessels in the brain. And this is very important, as you'll see in a few minutes. Once we do that, the patient is brought to the operating room, they're put to sleep. We then create some uh, uh, trajectories through the robot, uh, planning essentially exactly where we want the electrodes to go. Then the next step is that we register the patient to the robot. And essentially what that does is that creates a 3D map for the robot. Uh, and that helps us continue our surgery and, and do it in the most accurate and effective manner. Now, when I talk about robots, some of the robots you might think, you know, they can do a lot more than what, what our current capabilities are. Essentially, the most important factor that the robot provides us with is that it eliminates a lot of human error. And you're gonna see that in the next few slides here. So once I've created those trajectories that I showed you earlier, then what I do is I bring the robot into the position that you see here. Um, then I use a, a special drill to actually access that area, as you're going to see in a minute. This is a pinhole opening, as I mentioned. And the, the real benefit to this is that it minimizes any kind of CSF leakage from that area. Now we've created a, uh, we've placed a small bolt, a skull bolt, which is holding that electrode in place. And this stylet creates a very, very small tract within the brain through which we can then place our electrode. And this is the, the second to last step here. Uh, again, this has all been pre-planned by our robot. You can see that we're placing it in very carefully. Um, and then we use these small caps to lock that electrode in place. Now, the important part here again to mention is that we, because it's a, almost a black box system where we're only able to see the skin area and not really looking at the brain directly, we really rely on the MRI and the imaging studies that we have to really in, ensure that we can pass that electrode in safely and, and accurately. The biggest advantage to this, as I mentioned, is that it's less invasive. We're able to sample multiple parts of the brain and even sample both sides of the brain. The biggest disadvantage, as I mentioned, is that there is a risk for vascular injury, but we've reduced that risk to less than a fraction of 1%. And so it's very, very rare that we cause any kind of blood vessel injury because of the quality imaging that we have. Now I'm gonna show you the process for a subdural grid implantation. 
while we do the surgery, we've kind of, it's, it's not as common to do and, and uh, much more, we, we rely heavily on the SEEG surgery I spoke of earlier. So you see here, we've made a large incision. We've elevated our skin flap. We're gonna make a window in the bone. This is what the brain looks like prior to us implanting these electrodes on the surface of the brain. And then again, talking about the advantages and disadvantages, the big advantage here is functional mapping. And we're not gonna to talk too much about that today, but the biggest disadvantage, as you can see, is that it's a larger surgery. It involves uh, implanting electrodes on the surface, which can sometimes cause uh, problems, irritation within the brain. And also it's very hard to sample both sides of the brain if we're ever interested in doing that. So you may ask, is subdural grid better than SEEG? Is SEEG better than subdural grid? Are they equal? Or do we not have an answer to that? And really it's not uh, worth spending a lot of time on this other than to know that we really tailor each surgery to our patient. Um, it, you know, we really decide based on everything that we see and what we think the most likely area is of the or where seizures come from, we use that as our test of choice in patients who need this. Now I'm going to talk about some of our therapeutic surgeries, and these are really, really where it becomes very exciting in epilepsy surgery. These are what I call maximally invasive surgeries. These are large surgeries that we do. The top left you see is what we call a temporal lobectomy. Um, we do that fairly commonly in people who have seizures coming from the temporal lobe. This picture on the right is actually called a hemispherectomy, and that's when we remove half of the brain. Again, if someone has, uh, this is not normal brain that we're talking about. This is abnormal brain, which is causing seizures. The next picture you see is also a surgery where we separate the two halves of the brain. Now we'll talk a little bit about these less invasive or minimally invasive procedures, because I think those are really where epilepsy surgery and where neurosurgery is moving towards. Uh, I'm going to start by talking about Neuropace, which is a neurostimulator. We'll talk a little bit about focused ultrasound as well as laser ablation. So these are some of our newest technologies, and, and there's three main ones to talk about. One is called responsive neurostimulation, or RNS. You may have heard of Neuropace. Deep brain stimulation is another one. DBS is, is being used very commonly. And then there's vagus nerve stimulation, which is our oldest technology and technique, which also has some very good outcomes depending on the, the type of patient we're talking about. So uh, responsive neurostimulation, the nice thing with that is that what you see here is that it is a, a device that we implant on the surface of the brain or in the deep parts of the brain. And we implant it in a way that it's close to or right in the area of the seizure onset. And what it does is it acts similar to how a defibrillator works in the heart. You see that it's, it's constantly monitoring. It starts to see a seizure start to develop. And then it sends this electrical stimulation, which the patient doesn't feel. And that can either abort or shorten that, that seizure significantly. Uh, this is a paper we recently wrote looking at some of our uh, robotic RNS implantations. Um, now we'll talk about deep brain stimulation. This is a different type of approach. It doesn't act in the same way as responsive nerve stimulation, but in some ways it works, uh, it, it works in a very different manner, uh, but it allows us to, uh, to treat patients who we may not be able to treat with responsive nerve stimulation or with resection surgery. And what you see here is that a lot of the outcomes are very similar, if not the same for that type of patient. And then finally, vagus nerve stimulation is our most, uh, is the oldest of the technology and techniques. It, there is a definite use for it in certain types of patients where we can't localize where the seizures are coming from within the brain. Uh, it involves us making two small incisions and wrapping a small wire around the vagus nerve and then implanting a generator within the chest wall. We don't really fully understand how exactly this device works other than to say that with this continuous stimulation that we provide within the vagus nerve, that creates some changes and alterations in the pathways within the brain, which then can reduce the seizures over time. Now I'm going to talk about laser ablation, which is a, uh, a different approach. And um, what you see here is that it uh, is, is very, very useful when we have deep structures in the brain that we're trying to treat. Um, it allows us to prevent or uh, avoid injuring the surrounding brain tissue and it allows us to really get into those deep areas and cause a, a ablation of those tissues 
and potentially create seizure freedom. In patients who have failed uh, laser ablation, we have to go back and do open surgery. Uh, interestingly, I'm, I have a surgery coming up in the next few hours in which that's exactly what happened. Uh, a patient had a laser ablation done in another hospital and he continued to have seizures. And so now we're gonna go back and do an open surgery to remove that area. So what you see here is three different, very good uses for uh, laser ablation. So mesial temporal sclerosis. So what you see here on the left picture, that circular white area, that actually is where uh, the ablation occurred. Um, and uh, mesial temporal sclerosis is the most common cause of epilepsy in adults. And so when it works, it's a really, really excellent approach because it just involves a single minimally invasive uh, uh, laser fiber, which we implant in the deep structures, and then we're able to ablate that area. These are some of the other structures and types of procedures that we can do, perinodular heterotopias and uh, hypothalamic heterotopia, all very, very good uses for this te technology. As I mentioned before, if we were to go in and do an open surgery to get to those same areas, that can often be much more invasive. It can cause injury to the uh, surrounding tissue. Um, really, I think it, it provides us with a really, really good and safe uh, technique for this. Finally, I want to talk about MRI negative epilepsy. And, and I really want to focus on this for a few minutes because this is one of the things that I think that at UCI, we really, really care about patients who have these very difficult to treat epilepsies. Um, oftentimes we have patients who come from other centers who may have already had epilepsy surgery or who have failed it or who are told that they're not good candidates. And, and what we really look to, to see is, you know, difficult to treat epilepsy patients, the ones who have the most difficult uh, epilepsies to treat, those are some of the ones we've had the greatest successes with. And so I want to talk a little bit about that. Um, what I do is I'll start by describing what I think is the ideal patient. So the ideal patient is a young patient with a recent seizure onset. They have an MRI, which shows a clear lesion on the, on the MRI. And if we're able to safely remove that, we can create people, we can give people seizure freedom in the rate of 75, even up to 80%. Now what's happening over time is that our actual seizure epilepsy patients come in and they really don't have that same kind of a picture. Oftentimes they're older, they may have a normal MRI, more of a long-standing history of seizures. Uh, really, you know, when we do our non-invasive tests, they may point to different parts of the brain. And in general, our seizure-free rates in those patients is much lower. We're talking probably closer to 50%. So one of the things, as I mentioned, is that we are very aggressive and really want to take care of patients, especially the most difficult to treat types of epilepsies. And so to do that, really the question is, how do we take a patient who has a normal MRI, but they have epilepsy and try and improve the outcomes so that they're closer to the patients who have lesions and that ideal patient that I mentioned to you. And so the first thing you have to do is really look at where, um, what are the main findings that we have and how are the two types of epilepsy similar and how are they different? And what you see here is when we go through all that information, what we really want to see is that um, the most important thing is looking at the ictal onset. And that's what I mentioned earlier on, where those seizures come from. Uh, in patients who have MRI negative epilepsy, it's very different than patients who have um, that ideal type of epilepsy I mentioned earlier. So there's three findings that we see that are the most common where the seizures come from. The first one is temporal plus. And what that means is that not only is the temporal lobe the onset of the seizures, but there's some other area outside of that. And that's where that temporal plus area comes from. The other type is neocortical or essentially uh, along the surface of the brain. Those types of patients are much more difficult to localize and are much diff more difficult to treat. And then also we have a contralateral ictal onset. And what does that mean? Well, that means that not only are we looking at patients having seizures from one side, but they could be potentially having it coming from the other side. So if I were to focus on those three things, and that's what we do here at UCI, uh, we can really try and, and, and localize and find those patients who have these types of onsets so that we can treat those. And if we can treat them, our hope is, and what we've seen you know, in our own patient population is that we can improve that seizure-free rate quite significantly. 
So as I mentioned before, the really the types of uh, uh, patients that we see are temporal plus. We have uh, those who have inadequate resections and then those who have been uh, falsely lateralized. And I'll talk about that in a minute. So this is the uh, temporal plus. This is a really interesting study done back in 2016, looking at patients who have temporal lobe epilepsy plus an additional area. And that could be the orbitofrontal area, insular area, essentially another part of the brain, as well as that temporal lobe. Now, if you look at those patients, if you just do a temporal lobectomy on those patients, the likelihood of them becoming seizure-free is very, very low. It goes down to about 20% over the five-year period. Um, this is a different picture. This is an inadequate resection, and we see this not infrequently at UCI as well. Patients may have gone to another center, had an epilepsy surgery, or even a temporal or a uh, tumor resection. And what has happened is that there is some residual tissue within the brain, which is irritated, and that's causing patients to have continued epilepsy over time. Oftentimes, if we can safely remove that tissue, we can create seizure freedom even in those patients. And then finally, this is a false or incorrect lateralization. What we know is that if a patient has seizures from one side of the brain, and we don't know if we see that on their scalp EEG, but when we do our invasive studies, we find that the seizures come from a different area. And if we don't treat those areas appropriately, we have very low rates of seizure freedom. That could be in the level of about 45 to 50%. So it's very important that we make sure that we localize the seizures appropriately. We resect the tissue uh, you know, uh, appropriately. And I'm gonna show you what we do here at UCI to um, really maximize that. Well, in terms of patients who have temporal plus epilepsy, in any patient who we are concerned that they have temporal lobe epilepsy, but potentially there's some additional area that we could potentially uh, uh, miss, what we do is with our SEG electrodes, we implant multiple areas of the brain outside of just that temporal lobe to ensure that we're not missing any areas. What we really want to do is see that if we can find an additional area or if the patient has multiple areas within the brain, we want to make sure that we understand where those are coming from. And if we have to, we can go ahead and also do a resection or treat those areas as well. Um, as I mentioned as well, false lateralization. One of the big mistakes people can make is that if you only focus on one area, let's say you focus on the right temporal area, but you don't implant the other side, there's a risk that you can potentially miss another area where seizures come from. Uh, and so very commonly, if we, if we have any concern, we're, we uh, will implant both sides, both temporal lobes, to really understand and make sure we're not missing anything. And then finally, uh, inadequate or incomplete resections. This is a patient that we did in which we implanted the left temporal uh, lobe. Um, on the left temporal lobe, we also have language in most people who are right-handed. And so what we did in this patient is we implanted a very high density array uh, subdural grid with the idea that we could map where language came from so that we could really maximize the amount of resection that we could do. Um, this, these patients all had very, very good outcomes. And I, I do think it's because of this kind of combined approach that we have, as well as the fact that we really utilize every type of technique and technology um, to, again, as I mentioned, get the best outcomes for our patients. Um, so finally, I just wanted to spend a minute looking at some of our patients uh, at UCI. There's about 35 patients that we have done who are MRI negative. Uh, so this is, again, just a small proportion of all the types of epilepsy patients we do. Um, and you can see that even in this very difficult to treat epilepsy group, we were able to get uh, some very, very high rates of seizure freedom in that 50 to 67 percent range. Um, and so uh, finally, I just wanted to conclude by saying that we, at, uh, you know, in epilepsy surgery, really utilize our technology um, to help improve our patient outcomes. It's really one of the few things in neurosurgery in which there's constantly new technologies and techniques coming out. And so it's very important to stay on top of those to really provide our patients with the best uh, types of treatments. The other thing to say is that level four epilepsy centers are really the place to, to go to and be seen if you failed you know, two to three medications. 
uh, if you go to level four epilepsy centers, those are the ones that can provide all the surgical and medical options available. When we do these, uh, then the next thing is that invasive monitoring is very, very helpful and useful in certain types of patients, especially those patients in which we don't have a good sense for where the seizures are coming from. And then finally, as I mentioned, uh, it is a team approach. We, we have a large team that includes epileptologists, neuropsych, neuroradiologists, uh, myself, the epilepsy surgeon, and really it's that team approach, which I believe is what gives us the best outcomes for our patients. Um, finally, if you have any other questions or anything else, feel free to call us at that number listed there. Otherwise, I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, I was able to end a little bit earlier. Let's see if we have any questions. All right, well, the first question is, uh, what does recovery look like after surgery? Well, that's a great question. Um, with a lot of these procedures, especially those minimally invasive surgeries, we generally keep people overnight at most. And really the reason for that is uh, just to monitor them overnight. Oftentimes patients feel you know, very minimal headache or uh, pain along the incision site. Um, with their laser ablation, sometimes patients go home the same day. Most commonly, as I mentioned, they stay overnight. Uh, if we have a larger surgery, a temporal lobectomy or a, a more uh, invasive procedure, sometimes patients will stay one to two days. Very rarely do, do patients stay longer than that, though. Any other questions? Uh, oh, so follow-up. So the next question was about follow-up post-surgery. Um, and uh, that's a great question as well. So the way I like to see the patients, I'll see them within seven to 10 days after our surgery. And the idea there is that we want to um, make sure that the incision looks well, we can remove the, uh, the staples or sutures at that time. Uh, at, at that point, then I like to, follow them at the three month and then the six month time frame, uh, And that's really just to understand, you know, what, are there any seizures? Or how, how are they doing overall? At that six month time point, I'll get an MRI. And then if the patients are doing really well, seizure free, we follow them usually once a year after that. Uh, the next question is, are there any clinical trials available at UCI? And that's a great question. We are actually just starting, we're working with a uh, company that has developed a intracranial uh, a, um, a, a system that basically pumps in uh, anti-epileptic medications into the pockets of the brain. Uh, this has been done, uh, they've done their first human studies in Australia, and we're going to be one of the first trial sites doing this in humans. Uh, I think this has a really potentially positive uh, outlook in terms of reducing seizures by, uh, you know, implanting these, these medications directly into the fluid-filled pockets of the brain. Uh, so I'm very excited about that. And I'm working very closely with the people, you know, the uh, company that does that. Um, and then another question was about risks associated with the surgery. So that's a very good question. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about how I describe it to the patients. Um, the biggest risks that we see are bleeding and infection, and those tend to be less than 1% to 2%. And that's basically for all the procedures we've talked about. Other things like stroke, coma, paralysis, death, never had a death with, with any of these surgeries, and all the other proceed, you know, all the other you know, major risks are less than 1%. So if you look at the overall, you know, I'd tell patients it's usually between two to five percent risk. Um, and, and so it's a very low risk for any of the procedures we do. When you look at those benefits, so becoming seizure-free is very, very important. If we can get you a patient to become seizure-free. Uh, that's you know what our real goal is. The thing that most people don't really appreciate, uh, especially those who have epilepsy, is that the risks of having epilepsy and seizures over time are actually much higher, in my opinion, than the surgeries, any of the surgeries that we do. And what do I mean by that? Well, the risks of having a fall and injuring yourself, you know, burns, uh, car accidents, all sorts of things we've seen, which are very unfortunate. There's something called SUDEP, which is a sudden unexplained death in epilepsy patients. That's another severe injury, you know, death that can happen just from having epilepsy. And 
So, um, you know, in, in our opinion, the outcomes are so good and the risks are so low with all the types of procedures we do that we really feel that, you know, if you failed medication, if you're a candidate for epilepsy surgery, it really is the best op next option for you. And especially when we can use some of these uh, techniques and technology to, to improve your, your outcomes. Um, here's another question. Oh, so one of the questions is, um, how do we decide who's a good candidate for DBS, RNS, and VNS? Um, and that's a really great question as well. Really, the the um, this is, a, again, as I mentioned before, a team approach. So each patient that comes in, we evaluate them separately. We evaluate them based on all the imaging, all the their history, all the neuropsych testing. And then as a group, we look at every you know, aspect of that patient to really decide what's the best option for them. It could be DBS, uh, it could be RNS, it could be uh, open surgery. Um, even with that being said, one of the main, the other factors we take into account is what would the patient want? Even when we've decided what our recommendation is, I always sit down with the patient and talk to them about all the options available and what our group is recommending. But again, we really factor in what the patient wants as well. Uh, it's really important that everyone's on board and that everyone agrees with uh, whatever that treatment option is. Um, another question is, do I need to continue medications after surgery? This is a really great question. And I think that's a better, it's a question better asked to our epilepsy neurology group. Uh, in general, what I've seen from that group is that if you become seizure-free within six months to a year, they may start to wean off some of your medications. Uh, they may wean them completely off, so you're not on any further medications, or they may wean it uh, and have you on a low dose of one medication. My personal uh, opinion, again, and I stay out of the medication part, but my personal opinion is that if you could stay on one medication at a low dose, that's kind of like an insurance policy. And what that does is it kind of, in my opinion or hope, is that it calms the brain keeps you from having seizures, you know, potentially five, 10, 20 years later. So um, again, it's, it's, everyone is different. We have patients who come completely off of medication. We have others who are on a very low dose. Uh, it really just depends on what we see in the patients and, and how they're doing. And again, very important to discuss that directly with the patients as well. Um, so I think that's, kind of uh, answered most of the questions here. Um, very happy to discuss this further if anyone has questions later on. Um, otherwise, thank you so much for coming to our talk and, uh, uh, and uh, thank you again. Have a great day, everyone.